Father, we pray now as we look at your word that you'd encourage us to walk holy. Lord, also encourage us to, to not have unrealistic expectations. I think, Lord, we trust in you and we believe you and, and we hope all things, love hopes all things. And we don't want to give up our hope, Lord, or, or to expect the best or to expect you to work. But at the same time, Lord, we don't want to have some sort of uh, unrealistic expectation that's been um, kind of in our minds and in a way that the devil could use against us to cause us to be uh, woefully discouraged. So may we be balanced, Lord. Help us to be wise. And we thank you for the honesty in your word and your, your, your light, Lord, that you shine in the word, that you don't hold anything back. So encourage us and speak to us as we Consider uh, this last bit that we uh, hear from Nehemiah. And so speak to us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we uh, come to the end, you'll, you'll note in this chapter that there's a lot of drama happening. And by drama, I mean bad. This isn't a good drama. This is, this is all sad stuff happening. Uh, Nehemiah apparently... Uh, after about 12 years being the governor, he takes a trip back, and we don't know exactly how long he's gone back to Persia. But while he's gone in Persia, things happen back in Jerusalem that aren't good, so that when he comes back from Persia, there's a spiritual decline. And so there's going to be several things, again, that we'll learn from him uh, about dealing with spiritual decline, and the main thing is prayer. It's the same thing we've been learning from him the whole book. The book begins with his prayer. As he hears the condition of Jerusalem, he begins to pray and wait on the Lord and fast and pour out his heart to the Lord and seek the Lord. Then he uh, is in the presence of the king, and the king asks him why he's sad, and he prays. And so the, the whole uh, drama unfolds and, and, and begins with his prayers, and it ends with a prayer. The last verse of the book of Nehemiah is a prayer. So uh, in this chapter in particular, as it's the end of the book, you, you know, you sort of want to end a book happily ever after. And Nehemiah lived happily ever after. And the Jews and Nehemiah lived happily ever after. But this is the Bible, and the Bible's honest. And uh, you might say, well, wait a minute, I want to live happily ever after. <laughs> you are living, aren't you happy and ever after? Isn't it going great? Um, well, you say, well, yeah, it depends on which minute you talk to me. Yeah, it's going good now. Last week it wasn't, or last year was, wow, I hope we never have a year like last year, or you know, we're in a season, things are going well, or we're in a season, everything's falling apart. Um, we're in a season of sickness. We're in a season of trial. And, and one of the things I think that's important with the Bible uh, is that it doesn't give you sort of the fairy tale ending. The Bible doesn't present to you this reality that life's going to be a bed of roses, um, the Bible is a story of sin and the fall of man and God's redemption through Jesus Christ. Jesus' victory, it's total. But the book of Revelation, it's the most triumphant book in the Bible, is filled with tragedy. We, we see at the beginning of the seals, a uh, quarter of the earth's population dies. Uh, all these different wars, the rise of the man of sin, the whole world believing in him and rejecting God. That's not really a happily ever after. Now, ultimately, God's victorious, but the story of the earth is a story of, of sin. And so, not to make you discouraged or hopeless, but just you have to have a balanced and a, and a real perspective that uh, you, won't, you won't be discouraged when sometimes things don't unfold the way you, you wish they unfolded. You have to be able to just keep going. You have to keep seeking the Lord. Ultimately, God's going to work it out. God causes all things to work together for good, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. If you don't have that verse memorized, Romans 8, 28, you need to memorize it. It's an anchor. Romans 8, 28. Memorize it. It's something you can hang on to because a lot of your life looks like chapter 13, where he leaves and all these amazing things happen. They've rebuilt the wall. The people have turned back to God. They've had this amazing revival. Um, but there's a law of nature that's also, I think, uh, it's in nature because it's a spiritual law, and that is things wind down. If there's something true about the nature of fire, that is if you leave it alone, it's going out. If you, if you have a fire and it's raging and you look at it and you go, man, we have a great fire, 
Look at it five minutes later, it's less than when you looked at it. <laughs> Look at it an hour later, and it's almost out. Unless you're adding logs, unless you're, you're, you're making sure it has oxygen, unless you're dealing with the, the, the exhaustion of the energy, it's going to go out. The fire tends to go out. And the second law of thermodynamics, that everything is, is unwinding, everything is, everything is depleting, it's just a law. Well, it's also spiritually true. Unless, unless you're feeding fuel, unless you're getting oxygen in there, unless, unless you're doing something with the fire, tending it and adding fuel to it, taking care of it, it's going to go out. So every spiritual work we've ever seen from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, you can study church history. There, there, there's always these great works of God and they're followed by what? A decline. And there will be another work of God and another decline and so that, that can be discouraging. You have, to, you have to handle it. You have to face it. And, and this book ends, uh, in a way, um, dealing with a lot of these compromises that had come into the, the, the life of the people. So verse 1, on that day, uh, they read from the book of Moses and the hearing of the people. In the book was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever come into the assembly because, and it goes back to the book of Exodus, because they'd not met the children of Israel with bread and water, but they hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our God turned the curse into a blessing. So they were to be separated from these two particular groups of people, the Moabites and the Ammonites. And when they heard that, verse 3, when they heard the law, they separated all the mixed multitude from Israel. So the the the. Uh, sort of a, a precursor. They're, they're dealing with wanting to try to take seriously what God has said, but we'll see that, that actually um, that was short-lived. So uh, verse 4. Now there's a separation, but before this, verse 4 says, Eliashib the priest had authority over the storerooms of the house of our God, and he was allied with Tobiah. Remember Tobiah? He's one of the enemies back in the beginning when Nehemiah came and there was Samballot and Tobiah and these other guys that came along that were ridiculing them, mocking them, then outright opposing them, falsely accusing them, threatening them. But the, the people of Israel were in alliances with these guys. And there will be two, two such alliances that we'll read about in, in the chapter. This is the first one. So the high priest, or the priest, he has the responsibility for um, those rooms that are right near the temple, probably right on the temple mount, where they would keep all the things dedicated for worship. When you have thousands of people coming to worship the Lord, you would need to have a lot of uh, materials readily available to participate in the worship. So they have all these storerooms for that. But this guy was in an alliance with Tobiah. And look at verse 5. I've always thought this was so sad. He had prepared for him a large room where previously they had stored the grain offerings and the frankincense, the articles, the tithes of the grain, the new wine and the oil, which were commanded to be given to the Levites and the singers and the gatekeepers and the offerings of the priests or for the priests. So there was a room that was set aside to house things that were dedicated to God and for worship, but they've moved that stuff out, and who they moved in there? An enemy of God. An enemy of God is in the place of where things should be dedicated to God. This is one of the, the best pictures in the whole Bible of our own hearts and our own struggle with sin in our own lives, because my heart is supposed to be dedicated to God. It's supposed to be housing all the rooms of my heart. If you think of your heart as like a storehouse and or a home with all these different rooms. Well, my whole life is dedicated to God. So if, if you thought of my heart in terms of a, a multi-roomed home, Jesus would be able to have free reign in every room, and it's all decorated how Jesus wants it, except for Satan has a, the den, and you know, <laughs> you know you can, there are these parts that are supposed to be dedicated to God, but instead some enemy of God's living there. But isn't that a, isn't that a perfect description of when we allow sin to become part of our lives. You're supposed to be dedicated to God, then why is Satan living right here? Why? This, this isn't like in Jerusalem or near Jerusalem. 
This is a room associated with the temple, most likely on the temple mount, and it's a place where they kept the frankincense. What do you do with frankincense? You burn it. You give it to God. It's an offering, a sweet-smelling fragrance. It's burnt on the altar, the altar of incense in the temple. Well, where do you keep it? Well, we store it here in this room. Well, not anymore. Tobiah has that room. It's his office. He has a loft. You know, the property in the old city of Jerusalem is expensive. Today, it's expensive. I think it probably always, once they got the wall around, you know, this guy is in an alliance with the priest and an area that, that was housing things dedicated to God now has an enemy of God living in it. So Nehemiah tells us how this happened. Verse 6, he said, During all of this time, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. And then after certain days, I obtained leave from the king. So we don't know how long he was there. There's lots of different guesses as to how long. I don't, I don't care to guess. It, he's, it's certain days. I know that. So he came back to Jerusalem, and he discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah. Nehemiah calls it evil. This was a place that's supposed to be devoted to God. And idolatry is that, that, that insidious and that, that subtle. It starts so subtle, and it's incremental, and there are these little compromises, and that's not that big of a deal, and that's not that big of a deal, and that's not that big of a deal. And then pretty soon, Tobiah has a room in the temple. You think, like, how, did, how do you do that? But that's how it happens. And so it's, it, it's, it's come on. He, he's, he's discovered this evil. He prepared him a, a room for him in the courts of the house of God. Verse 8, it grieved me bitterly. One of the themes of the end of the book here, and why I started off by saying that things don't always go the way we want them to go, if you want to serve the Lord, you're going to have to learn how to find your joy from the Lord Find your meaning in your relationship with God because if you, if you draw your identity and you draw your meaning from how other people are doing or how the ministry is going or, or whatever thing you're putting your hands to and you're trying to serve the Lord, if you're drawing your identity or your meaning from the things you're doing for the Lord, you're going to quit. <laughs> you know why? Because fires go out. They tend to go out. And if, if you're Nehemiah and you risk your neck and you make the journey and you spend all these years, 12 years, making a stand, you've rebuilt the walls, you've established the worship, you go back to Persia, you think it's been 12 years, I can leave these guys, it's going to be fine, you're gone for certain days and you come back, Tobiah has a room in the temple. I think he was grieved, it's probably an understatement. How would you feel? Or how do you feel when someone that you've discipled turns away from the Lord? Or how do you feel when, you know, things don't go the way you want them to go or somebody that you really cared about, you know, just really goes off the deep end? It's very discouraging. We'll have a pastor's conference here in just a couple weeks, and you're all invited, but you have to sign up. You can't come for free. Don't walk in and think you get the homeboy discount. You don't. You have to, if you want to come, you're welcome. Uh, you have to sign up, but you're, you'll be here and, and you'll find out if you come, if you haven't ever been to a pastors and leaders conference, there's a whole lot of people that will come pretty discouraged. You know why? Because Tobiah has a room in the temple. Like this isn't the first time this happens and this ain't the last time it happens. It happens in our own personal lives. We, we're fighting against this. He's always ready, you know, to make a, make a play for some part of our heart. But in the ministry, it's, it can be very discouraging so he says, I was grieved. It grieved me bitterly. Now, I don't know that I can recommend his uh, response. I'm not going to um, say that he's wrong. I don't know that uh, necessarily I should tell you to do this, maybe as it relates to your own heart. But look what he does. Nehemiah is a fireball. Verse 8, he said, Therefore, I threw all the household goods of Tobiah out of the room. What did he do? He dealt with it. He's a leader. He's the appointed governor, so he has authority to do this. He has the right to do it. He has the accountability before God to do it. And he's not afraid. This guy's in, Eliashib's in an alignment with Tobiah. Why? What do you think? What would drive somebody to make an alliance with someone ungodly? Well, cha-ching! has to be dollar signs. It's money. It's money or it's power. Or these guys like each other. You got three lusts that drive men 
pleasure or money or power. So either these two guys got a thing going on. I don't think that's what it is. It doesn't say. But you can see these guys are the power brokers when, when Nehemiah comes back and seeks the welfare of Israel. To be in an alignment with these guys, these guys are, these guys are the leaders of the, of the people groups that are around, around Jerusalem. So yeah, we want you in here. Yeah, let's get this thing going and, and you know, I'll get a better deal on this and yeah, you can traffic this in here and I want 20%. No, 20%, that's too much. 15%, all right. Well, if you throw in a room in the temple, I'll give you 18%, right? What's happening? It's compromise and it probably has everything to do with money. So he, uh, you have these leaders that are not focused on the Lord. This guy's the priest He has authority in the temple, and yet he's more interested in making a gain for himself. And so he's made room for Tobiah. Now you've got a godly leader who doesn't have a personal agenda. And a godly leader without a personal agenda can be used by the Lord to say, well, I'm not against anyone, but this is wrong, and we're going to deal with it. So he goes into the room and takes all the guy's stuff from Ikea and throws it out. He chucked everything, just opened the doors and chucked all the guy's stuff out. Imagine what people were thinking when he was doing it. Man, Tobiah's going to be so mad. And I think Tobiah was glad he wasn't there. And I'm, I'm not stretching it. Later on, we'll see what Nehemiah does when some guys are around, <laughs> what he does to them personally. Here he just chucks everything out, the, out, the, um, out of the room. And I commanded them, verse 9, to cleanse the rooms. Now, what would that mean? Did they get Lysol and is Tobiah like a slob and you know, there's French fries everywhere or something? No, the place is supposed to be holy. They, they need to sanctify it. They're going to probably take some of the anointing oil and come and, 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 and just cleanse and sanctify the place. It's supposed to be devoted to God. And, and this enemy of God's living there. So uh, they brought back into the room in verse 9 all the articles of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. And then verse 10, I also realized that the portions for the Levites had not been given to them. For each of the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone back to his field. So these, these two things might have worked together where you've got an empty storehouse, so what was in there? Well, frankincense and the portions for the Levites and the priests. Well, it's empty. So, well, we might as well use it for something. I mean, is it the, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Are people not giving and so now the thing's emptied out and we might as well use it or... Have we moved the stuff out and people are discouraged because Tobiah is there? It would be really discouraging. You wouldn't be inspired to give your money generously to the ministry when Tobiah is living in the temple, right? Don't you think? I mean, if we started selling drugs out of the church building, you probably wouldn't be inspired to put money in the offering box. You roll up and you see us we're out there. Oh, hey, what's up? You know, selling stuff. What are you, what are you guys doing? Oh, don't worry about it. Just get into church. You're not going to be pumped up to go, I just can't wait to give. You're probably going to say, I'm not going to give anymore. So Tobiah is living in the temple. So it, it, these things, like all sins, they, they sort of, you know, if you let one area go, what's going to happen? You, you start to get wiped. Like, how does it work? I don't know exactly, but they, I think they work together here negatively. So the portions hadn't been set aside for the Levites. So verse 11, he contended with the rulers. I contended with the rulers and I said, why is the house of God forsaken? It's a good question for leaders. Why is the house of God forsaken? You guys are the leaders. What are you doing? I gathered them all together and I set them in their place. Then all Judah brought the tithe of that grain and the new wine and the oil to the storehouse. I appointed as treasurers over the storehouse Shelemiah the priest and Zadok the scribe, and of the Levites, Padiah. Next to them was Hanan, the son of Zachar, the son of Mataniah. And they were considered faithful, and their task was to distribute to their brethren. Now here's uh, the first of, of four prayers that are, that are in this chapter. So verse 14, Remember me, O my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for its services. Now the next issue. Verse 15, in those days I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and loading donkeys with wine and grapes and figs and all kinds of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. 
and I warned them about the day on which they were selling provisions. Men of Tyre dwelt there also, who brought in fish and all kinds of goods, and sold them on the Sabbath to the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Men of Tyre. Tyre is a seacoast town on the north part of Israel. So these are guys that are fishermen. They've got connections on the coast. They've moved up into the hills. Jerusalem's above 3,000 feet elevation. There's no fishing up there. So these guys are importing, bringing fish up, and they're selling it so you can sell it for a premium. So these guys got a pretty good business thing going. So you're not going to shut the doors of the Arden Mall on Sunday. You know, people aren't working. We're going to keep it open. Like it's, it's, they're, you know, they're going to go for it. So those guys aren't Jews necessarily, um, most likely not. So verse 17, again, he goes right for the leaders. I contended with the nobles of Judah, and I said to them, what evil thing is this that you do by which you profane the Sabbath day? Then he asked them a question. Did not your fathers do thus, and did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city, and yet you bring added wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath? So he reminds them, how do we get in this mess in the first place? Our fathers stopped listening to God. We stopped taking God's command seriously. They broke the Sabbath. They broke every other law after that. But it starts, again, starts small. It's like, what's the big deal? We just stay open one more day. You know, people need to be able to shop. Probably makes the Sabbath even better. People have more peace because they're able to shop. In fact, we give a Sabbath day discount. Extra 10%. And Nehemiah reminds them, God disciplined us. God judged us. We got hammered. Are you going to do this again? Are we going to repeat the same experience? Are you going to disobey God and get a different result? So then, verse 19, so it was at the gates of Jerusalem as it began to be dark before the Sabbath. Remember that the Jewish day begins at sundown. So our day begins in the middle of the night, at midnight. But for the Jewish day, it's, the sun goes down, that's the start of the next day. So it's getting ready to start the Sabbath. So it's starting, the sun's starting to go down. He said, so I commanded, verse 19, the gates to be shut, and I charged that they must not be open till after the Sabbath. And I posted some of my servants at the gate so that no burdens would be brought in on the Sabbath day. Now the merchants and the sellers of all kinds of wares, they lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. And then I warned them, and I said to them, why do you spend the night around the wall? If you do so again, I'll lay hands on you. See, he's a little fiery. He's got his guys there. If anybody comes in, deck them, you know, take them out. And so the guys come out on the Sabbath, they're hanging around, like, what is it going to open the gates, maybe? We'll come in. So they do it once or two, and he comes out there, like, you know, they ain't going to keep doing it. Why? If, you don't, if you're here again, I'm going to pound you guys. Don't come back. So he says, in, in that time, from that time on, at the end of verse 21, they came no more on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should go and guard the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. So these guys should have been doing it. So Nehemiah is gone, and when he comes back, Tobiah has a room in the temple. The people have stopped bringing in the tithes and offerings, so all the Levites and the singers who were devoted to worship, they've all gone back to work because the community is not supporting the worship. So the, the people have gotten totally careless and, and they've lost their spiritual vitality. Then the guys are bringing in all these goods on the Sabbath day. It's like a marketplace on the Sabbath instead of a time of seeking the Lord. And the Levites aren't doing anything about it. So you've got failure of the nobles, failure of the leaders, failure of the Levites, failure of the people. And his prayer at the end of verse 22, remember me, O my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of your mercy. It's not the end of the chapter, though. Verse 23, In those days I also saw Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Now the Jews, not for the sake of racism, because God's not racist, but God had called the Jews to be a separated people unto him. They had a sign of the covenant, which in all the males was circumcision, and they were commanded by God to not marry from outside of the Jewish family so that God would keep this family intact and that out of that family he would bring the Messiah into the world. So their, 
their separation from the world was to speak to the world about a great reality of, of what that would ultimately mean in Jesus Christ. Do not love the world or the things in the world. For everything that's in the world, it's all passing away, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. The people in Jesus Christ separated, not racist, not saying, well, this race and that race, but we're not in the world. We live in the world, but we're not, we're not marrying ourselves to the world. We're separated from it. So the Jews were to have this separation to maintain a holiness before the Lord, to bring the Messiah into the world, and also to be a picture of separation. Now, there are these other groups of people that are living there in the land, Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Verse 24, they've gotten married. Now half the children spoke the language of Ashdod, and they couldn't speak the language of Judah, but they spoke according to the language of one or the other people. Now, verse 25, so I contended with them, and I cursed them, and struck some of them, and pulled out their hair. And I made them swear by God, you shall not give your daughters as wives to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons or yourselves. So he, he rips their hair out. Now, Ezra deals with the same issue, and Ezra is a leader at the same time as Nehemiah is, and when Ezra's dealing with this issue, it's, he says he rips his own beard out and his own hair out. So you have your choice in ministry. You can be more like Ezra or more like Nehemiah. Ezra ripped his hair out. Nehemiah ripped their hair out. Now, I don't, I, I don't think we have to wonder how this applies to our lives because the Bible tells us how to treat people. Don't rip anyone's hair out, okay? If you're in Sunday school and a kid needs a good ripping, don't give it to him. <laughs> you know, we, uh, a kind answer turns away wrath. Love covers a multitude of sins. Mercy triumphs over judgment. You know, we're, we're the, a mark of the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness, kindness, gentleness. But that doesn't mean we don't deal with sin. We don't ignore it. We, we try to help people get out of it. And you don't help someone get out of it by denying it or saying it doesn't exist or that it's a disease or that it's not really their fault or someone else's fault. The only way you can deal with sin is by confessing it, right? If you don't confess your sin, then you're going to be in trouble. If you, if you seek to cover your sin, the Bible says you will not prosper. But if you confess and forsake it, you'll find mercy. So what's happening here is a, is a swift and severe dealing with sin. And again, another reminder of their past. Verse 26, didn't Solomon, the king of Israel, sin by these things? What was Solomon's downfall? It's very clear. Many wives. We talked about Tobiah. Why is Eliashib have Tobiah having a room in the temple? Probably money or power or probably some combination of both. What, what's the deal with all these women? It's about pleasure. It's about something else. You got three lusts, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And you've got them in spades now. You've got them overflowing. Nehemiah's been gone and he's come back and he's got all this stuff. He walks down the street and some kid's speaking Moabite. And he sees him with his Jewish dad or his Jewish mom and then the, un the unbelieving parent. And he's like, what is going on here? What are you guys doing? Don't you remember what happened to Solomon? Yeah, but I'm going to win this person to the Lord. Here's the interesting thing about uh, being unequally yoked. There's a lot of influencing going on when you're unequally yoked. It's always in the wrong direction. It's never the righteous person influencing the unrighteous. It's always the unrighteous dragging down the righteous person. Didn't Solomon, the king of Israel, sin by these things? And yet among many nations there was no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, pagan women caused even him to sin. Should we then hear of your doing all this great evil transgressing against our God by marrying pagan women? And then another thing, one of the sons of Joiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, he was son-in-law of Sanballat the Horonite. Now Sanballat is the main leader of the opposition that fought against the, the Jews being in the land, fought against the wall being built. And you've got a son of the high priest is married to one of the daughters of Sambalat. What do you think that's about? Have you ever heard in human history when one leader and another leader and they give their kids to be married to each other, does that ever happen? <laughs> yes. Why does that happen? It's about power. So we've got spiritual leaders that are trying to, to, 
to secure their power. Whenever you have men or women that are in positions of leadership or they've got an opportunity to be a leader and then they become enamored with the idea of gaining power, you're going to end up with unholy alliances every single time. So what did Nehemiah do to him? We don't know exactly how this happened. Maybe he put him in the car because it says, I drove him from me. But I don't, I don't think he did it with a car. <laughs> I don't know how he did it, but he's already ripped some guy's hair out. So I drove this guy from me. So chase that guy off. Then, then the, another prayer, verse 29, Remember them, O my God, because they've defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. And thus I cleanse them of everything pagan. I also assign duties to the priests and to the Levites, each to his service, and to bring in the wood offering and the first fruits at appointed times. And he ends by saying, Remember me, O my God, for good. So it ends with this prayer. Remember me, O God, for good. What do you do in times of spiritual declension? When everything's going down and it was going up and things were looking good and people were interested and people were growing and then all of a sudden it's not even a plateau. It's people are falling away. People are backsliding. People are, one person's going back to this and one person's doing that and another thing of there. And, and, and Nehemiah shows us how to deal with it. It's interesting because you'd think that a book that was about the rebuilding of the wall, you'd think the book of Nehemiah is about the rebuilding of the wall, but they finished the wall a long time ago. It's more about the people. And it was, in a way, you'd look at the book and you'd say, it was easy to build the wall compared to dealing with these people. Exactly. You know, when we got our building permit to build out the inside of this building, um, it was empty, you know, just the four walls. We put in an elevator and up, you know, we had to build a building inside of our building to build the upstairs. We got the permit in the, in the end of June or the end of July. I forget the exact day, maybe the 25th or something like that. And, uh, and we moved in before Christmas. It was, just, it was less than five months, you know. And I remember uh, Eric telling me, you know, if, if there was a miracle and everything was perfect, and he said, we, would, we wouldn't get in in six months. And so it was more than miraculous. Listen, building a building is easy. You know why? Because you just fix it and it's there. And it'll look fine until these colors are lame and out of style, and then we'll just paint it. How hard is it to paint? You paint it and it looks different. But what about a human being? What kind of, what kind of things have happened in the just couple years that we, since we've been inside the building? How many people have gotten saved, but how many people have fallen away? How many people made really good decisions and their lives changed for the better and God's doing this great work? And then how many other people made terrible decisions and really blew their life up? Totally ruined it, spoiled it. And then how many messed it up and then turned back around? <laughs> and then messed it up again and turned back around again? And messed it up again and turned back around three or four times in the last couple of years? It's discouraging, right? Could it be? Have you ever been discouraged? You ever pour your heart into somebody or something and you felt led by the Lord and, and you thought, oh, and, and it went really well. It was whoosh, it's on this trajectory. And that's an encouraging time in the ministry. And then there's the other trajectory. <laughs> that one's not so encouraging. How do you deal with it? The Bible doesn't hide the fact that human beings are always going to be human beings. And if you're going to minister to people, people are going to be people... They're sinners. We're making disciples. They're not disciples. You're not going to go find them. Don't go look around and I'm going to find the perfect disciple and then I'll lead him to the Lord and then I'll have a really great disciple. You know, what you find is somebody who's really messed up, who needs Jesus and they're hungry for Jesus and then you just walk with them and they have ups and downs and ups and downs and you just love people and walk with them and you try to overcome the discouraging times. But it can be very, very discouraging it's interesting the way that this book ends. And I think that it ends this way to give us an encouragement. It's a book about service. So what do you do when things are going bad? What did Nehemiah do throughout the book? He prayed. What happens in this book repeatedly? I mean, in the last chapter. There's four times he prays. The spiritual declension, and it's answered how? Remember me, God. <laughs> I think that that's, that's an appropriate way because this this is, these prayers are about the people, but they're also about the leader, the person that's serving, dealing with the difficulty of somebody not listening to the Lord. 
If, you have a, if you're a parent, you have a child who's not walking with the Lord, and you have a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter, you know what I'm talking about. If you taught a Sunday school class, you know, and, you, and then you see a kid grow up later, and you see him, and you see him at the store, you see him outside, and they're getting drunk, or they're getting high, and you think, what's going on, you know? This person's not even walking with the Lord. It's heartbreaking, super discouraging. So Nehemiah is asking God for help. He prays in verse 14, the first one, remember me, O my God, concerning this. Remember that was the people uh, getting um, distracted. They weren't seeking first the kingdom. Verse 11 is is the statement, why is this house of God forsaken? So he says, remember me, O God, or O my God, concerning this. Do not wipe out my good deeds that I've done for the house of my God and for its services. What's his prayer? Don't let my labor be in vain. Don't let my labor be in vain. If you're going to serve the Lord, you're going to feel at some point like your labor is in vain. That's just the way it is. Now, if you're a mom, you already know what I'm talking about. Dads, you don't do enough work around the house to understand, but moms for sure. But if you get involved in any way outside yourself, you say, I'm going to take the focus off of me and meeting my needs, and I'm going to get involved. I'm going to meet someone's needs. I'm going to put my energy to it, my money behind it, my heart into it, and I'm going to, I'm going to serve the Lord. And, and you're going to get to a point, I promise you, I'm sorry, but it's true, where you're going to think, my labor was in vain. Listen to our hero, Super Paul. The guy, you read about him in the book of Acts, you think the guy never has a bad day, always trusts God. Listen to what he says. I'm just going to read a bunch of verses. Galatians 2, 1 and 2. Then, 14 years later, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and I took Titus with me. I went up by revelation and communicated to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Galatians 3, verse 3. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Galatians 4, 9 through 11. But now after you had turned to God, or rather, or, but now after you've known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid for you, lest I've labored for you in vain. So several times he points out first his dealing with the apostles and the gospel to the Gentiles. Was that like, have I labored in vain now with these people? Now you say, Rich, well, I've read Galatians. Those people were kind of messed up. So he was worried about them, but not the other churches. Philippians 2, verse 16. Hold fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I've not run in vain or labored in vain. Well, you say, well, it's just the Galatians and the Philippians. They're the ones that are messed up, but everybody else is okay. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 5. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. You say, well, it's just the Galatians and the Philippians and the Thessalonians that are messed up. First Corin- well, 1 Corinthians, here's the encouraging one. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So Paul knew his labor was not in vain. Well, then why does he keep saying so that my labor is not in vain. I hope my labor is not in vain. I couldn't, I so worried of the tempter tempting you, so I, I had to, you know, find out was, you know, what happened to you guys. That's just the way it is, okay? So you just need to know that. Don't, don't have some idealistic, I, you know, concept in your mind, this happily ever after. I'm going to teach a Sunday school class, and once I enter the room, all the children will raise their hands to accept the Lord. And they will ask Jesus into their hearts, and they will never, any of them, ever fall. They'll never stumble, and they'll all grow up and become apostles of the last days. They'll be the 144,000. That's my Sunday school class, a whole new cult. You know, you could get the idea that getting involved in ministry somehow is going to have this sort of future that, and it's an unrealistic expectation. I think that the devil would want us to have those kind of unrealistic expectations because the reality, when it sets in, boy, you just think, I've wasted my time. I've wasted my time. Well, you didn't. 
Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Who did you do it for? Why did you do it? What were you doing? And you answer those questions, you find the answer of those back in Jesus, and you find strength to keep going. You say, well, Lord, you're you got to work. Remember me. That's what he says. Remember me concerning all these things and don't wipe out my good deeds <laughs> that I've done. He's, he's gone and he comes back and the whole place has gone crazy. Lord, remember me and don't wipe out all the stuff that I did because I was just gone certain days and now look at what's happened. They've gone backwards. The next uh, prayer. Let's see. Jump down um, to verse 22. Remember me, oh my God, Concerning this also, this is about the Sabbath, and spare me according to the greatness of your mercy. (laughs) Spare me, Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on us, Lord, and don't wipe us out. He gets back to Jerusalem, and the people are disregarding the commandment of God. What happens when the people of God start disregarding the commandments of God? It's going to be the judgment of God. Or we would use the word discipline because every child who's loved by their parent is disciplined by their parent. And God is a good God. He's a good father. And like any good father, he disciplines his kids. Listen, I have five kids. They're, they're all grown up. You know, I don't get to discipline them. Now I just smile and say, well, what do you want to do? You know, what do you, well, what do you think? You know, I have these adults now. But I promise you, when they were little and they were lying or they were doing what they weren't supposed to do or they were treating each other in a way that wasn't appropriate, they got disciplined. Now, I didn't beat them. I didn't wail on them. I didn't you know, cause you know, physical harm or damage to them. But they had consequences. That's what we called it in our house, consequences. There's consequences. We use the word all the time. Some of them, it's the word they heard more than any other word in English. Consequences. You knew that when this behavior would result in these consequences, and they would just have that look like I have when my father, see, my heavenly father has not stopped disciplining me. There's consequences. You need to stop it. You need to knock it off. So have mercy on us, this prayer. He comes back and he sees the declension when, when there's decline, what should you pray? Lord, have mercy on your people. Lord, have mercy. We pray for mercy when we need mercy. Hebrews 4, 16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Now the next prayer. Jump down to verse 29. Remember them, O oh my God. Now this is the guy that he drove away, the guy that, that was married to the, the daughter of Sam Ballot, the son of the high priest. Remember them, O oh my God, because they've defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Remember Jesus in the model prayer? In the, he said, when you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And what? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. When there's spiritual declension, you know what a good prayer is? Deliver us. <laughs> that's, what this, that's how I read this prayer. Remember them, oh my God. These guys are the leaders and they've corrupted it and they've allowed these things and they're doing these things. Lord, deliver us. Deliver us from evil. Deliver us from it. Set us free. And the last one, the way the thing ends, remember me, oh my God, for good. We come to that throne of grace. We get mercy. Lord, spare us. Don't give us what we deserve. And Lord, remember me for good. <laughs> we, he's praying for grace. The way, that you, the way that you go forward when there's spiritual decline is you dive into the grace of God. You just go into it. And you, get, you, just, you just get the Lord's strength. You have his love, his joy. It fills your heart. And then you're, you're able to go forward because you're going forward because of what Jesus is in your life, who he is, who he is apart from all the decline. Listen, if, if, the, if, if America keeps going the way it's going, I mean, it, I shouldn't say keeps going. 
if God lets the thing be what it is, I think he should stop. Listen, they, there is so much discrimination right now against people who believe. Just flat out violate the Constitution. Straight up violate the Constitution. And so many Americans have their constitutional rights as it relates to the freedom of thought, the freedom to disagree, the freedom to believe what you want to believe that's already been taken away from so many Americans. It just hasn't been taken away across the board. But it's completely happening. So we just aren't reaping it. So if, if God lets the whole thing decline, you've got churches that are you know, the largest church in the country. I think with Joel Osteen is the pastor. The guy doesn't talk about Jesus, doesn't talk about sin, doesn't talk about repentance. He's as happy as can be. He writes a book. Everyone buys it. Your best life now. Your best life now. Where are you going to go after you die? Well, if you're having your best life now, that's not good news. Right? What's the good news? The good news is your best life is it's coming. The, the most you're going to know about hell is what you have on this planet. If you're going to heaven, the most you'll know about hell is what happens on this, on, on this, in this life. Your best life is not now. Make a home on earth. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. To twist that around and make it like God's kingdom is your wealth and your prosperity and your happiness. Now listen, God loves you and wants to work in your life. He wants to bless you, wants to lead you. But to twist it and to appeal to people's flesh and to give them a false message. So you can see the decline and you see the, per, the, the unholiness in the nation, the unholiness just generally speaking, even in the believers. So many people will say that they believe in Jesus if you ask them in a survey, a Gallup poll or something. So many will say that they're believers, but they don't live like believers. So what do you, what do, you do in the middle of that? How do you do that? You're only, going to find, you're only going to find meaning in Jesus. He says, Lord, remember me for good. <laughs> I'm doing what you said, and I'm doing it the way you said it, and this is crazy. Chapter 13 is a crazy chapter. It's a sad thing. We have the worldliness, the mixed multitude, the first couple of verses, the people of Ammon that are, that are in the midst of the people that turns into the, these uh, marriages. The compromise, Tobiah in the temple, giving away the things that belong to God. An enemy living in the place where things used to be that were dedicated to God. Not putting the kingdom of God first. The house of God forsaken. The people of God having no priority. The word of God or the, the plan of God, the work of God is, is not first. It's not where they invest their time or their energy. That's very discouraging. The love of money, the Sabbath being broken. When the people of God care more about money and getting money than they care about doing what God said. You know, if, you had a, if we had a seminar and, hey, what are you going to do? We got a money expert. He's coming in. He's going to tell you how to keep more of your money. Pack the place out, couldn't you? We're going to go verse by verse through the Bible. Well, I'm busy that night. My TiVo you know, is not working right, and I'm going to miss my favorite show or whatever. The love of money, man. The love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. This last one, going back to old ways. Didn't Solomon learn this about these unbelievers? Didn't we already learn about this Sabbath breaking? You guys are going back to your old ways. All of these things are things that people still do. Going back to your old ways, loving money, not putting the kingdom of God first, giving away things that belong to God, worldliness. That describes the church in America, doesn't it? Hey, that describes my life. What do you do? You pray. Lord, deliver us. Lord, work. Lord, have mercy. Lord, be gracious. And you rip your own hair out. That's what I'll say about Nehemiah's tactics. Rip your own hair out. Hey, if there's part of your life where you've let the enemy come in and have one of the rooms, someplace things were dedicated to God at one point, and now the enemy lives there, kick him out. Take immediately, do what Nehemiah did. He went into, he went into that place, 
He took everything that belonged to that dude and he threw it out. Do that. Do it in your own heart. Now, don't go do that to your friend, okay? Don't go over to your friend. They've got to make their own decision. But Jesus said, if your right hand is causing you to sin, what? Chop it off. Deal with it severely. Deal with it swiftly. Deal with it in a, in a radical way. If your foot's causing you to sin, chop it off. You're better off having one foot and going into life than having both feet and going into hell. If your eye, your right eye, if your eye's causing you to sin, pluck the thing out. We know he's speaking hyperbole because we know you could sin with the other eye just fine. Popeye was a sinner. Right? The Bible says, do all things without grumbling and complaining. He's the biggest grumbler in cartoon history. Half of his lines are, you know. I don't know if you guys remember Popeye, but he's a grumbler, man. If he's anything else, he's a grumbler. Three, 80% of what that dude says, under his breath. Olive oil, you just hear, olive oil, Brutus. The guy's only got one eye. Still sinning just fine. So Jesus isn't saying, literally, you're not going to cure your sin problem by poking out your eye. What was the, what's the point of the hyperbole? Deal with it. Just, if you've got a place where the enemy has made himself at home, in a place that's supposed to be dedicated to God, because who's the temple of God? It's not this building's not the temple of God. You're the temple of God. If you've let Tobiah come and have a room, get him out. Kick him out tonight. Father, help us do that. Lord, we want to have holiness in the fear of God. So have mercy on us. Lord, we think of Nehemiah's prayers. Remember me. Just the longing to be right with you, the longing for you to think of him, the longing for you to protect him, deliver him, deliver the people. Lord, have mercy. Help us to, to learn these lessons. And I pray, Lord, that we'd be emboldened and inspired to minister, to serve, to do your will, Lord. Speak to us and tell us what you want us to do and how you want it done so we can accomplish your will in these last days. And as we do it, Lord, may we just do it as unto you finding our identity and our joy in Jesus Christ. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Amen. God bless the rest of your week. See you Sunday.